The young woman is with child, and she shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. So when Isaiah speaks about a woman bearing a son and naming him Emmanuel, we think of Jesus who fulfills that for us. But you do need to know that this prophecy also mattered specifically to Isaiah and his time. That um, he was speaking to the king, standing looking at the king's wife, saying, see here, for to you a child will be born, and his name will be Emmanuel. And the king's son was Hezekiah. If you remember last week, Hezekiah was one of those kings that brought some goodness and some faithfulness back to the people of Judah. So it's good to see how these things happen different ways and different times and how they're understood. Now the next prophet we want to mention is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, sometimes known as the weeping prophet. Oh, this man was doom and gloom. And uh, he was the one that was trying to tell them, you know, hope is disappearing rapidly. The, you are going to be hauled away. Jerusalem's going to fall. The temple is going to be destroyed. He had a tough time keeping his spirits up. And God actually takes him aside at one point and shares with him some hopeful words, which we will recognize. John. Right. You youngsters will know Jeremiah as Jeremiah was a bullfrog. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there you will hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled by the potter's own hand. And so he reworked it into another vessel that was good and pleasing to him. O house of Israel, can I not do this with you, just like the potter has done? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. A timeless and hopeful prayer. Now, the third prophet I want to mention to you is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is important because he was a priest before Judah fell. Um, he was part of the, the leadership of the people, and God calls him out to be a prophet, and the way his prophecies come is through visions. And he is one of the first, uh, the first to be taken away into exile, along with that first wave of leaders and uh, important people. So his prophecies uh, speak uh, to the time of the exile and the time after the exile, and there are these amazing visions. Listen to a couple of them. Ezekiel's first vision is full of fire, you see it? And four creatures with four wings each, all within wheels. Can you see them? Within wheels and wheels, all beneath a crystal dome on top of which was a fiery, seemingly human form with splendor all around it. This figure was the Lord who spoke to Ezekiel, calling him to be a prophet. Now we see a second series here with bones. You see him looking at bones. The other really well-known vision of Ezekiel happened when God commands him to prophesy to a valley full of bones, which are all connected. The thigh bone connected to the hip bone, the hip bone connected to the... They're all connected as Ezekiel speaks and they are covered with tendons and muscles and they rise up in real bodies and the breath comes to them when he speaks again and they come to life as a big vast army god's way of showing that god will bring the people of israel back to life so this morning we are going to continue skipping through the old testament the hebrew bible trying to just pull the main storyline so we remember and recall how we arrive where we are as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And as I said earlier, that northern tribe is gone. So now it all focuses on Judah. And Judah is really not much better off than those scattered folks. The voices of the prophets that you heard earlier, they are there to give the people maybe one shot at pulling it together. 
but also then ultimately warning them of what it's going to be like to be in exile and what's going to happen and the temple is going to be destroyed and it's going to be truly a hard season. Jeremiah tells them 70 years in exile. So as Nebuchadnezzar, and you might remember that name, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon gradually conquers Judah, it takes 10 years, that first wave of important people go into exile. These are people like Ezekiel who are priests and leaders, nobility, smart people, people who might cause trouble, uh, educated people as well. And in that first wave is a young man named Daniel and some of his friends who we know best as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, uh, they were singled out like other young men who were smart and capable and bright and noble and uh, brought to be part of the king's court. The king kind of wanted to know who the people were that he had just conquered, but he also wanted to assimilate some of their leaders in a very particular way. So one of the first things he uh, does is something that we'll come to in just a moment, but the stories I bet that come into your head when I talk about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel are these. Um, We know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into a fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to the idol, and they were spared certain death because an angel was there with them. We know that much, much later in time, Daniel had a similar offense against the king, and he was thrown into the lion's den, and he also lived to tell the tale because God protected him and was uh, rewarding his faithfulness. But the story that I do want to focus on this morning is the one about their arrival in Babylon, the one that I alluded to when I was talking to the children. Because what the king offered a whole group of young men who were coming into service uh, from, the, uh, from Judah was food from his table, fine wine and fine things to eat. They would have a ration of that every day. Well, Daniel um, did not wish to do this, and neither did his friends. And so he went to the, um, the palace master, who was responsible for all of them, and he said, you know, we don't want to pollute our bodies with this food. We would like a simple diet of vegetables and water. And at first, the palace master was very reluctant to do this because um, it would fall on his head if they didn't thrive. But he finally agrees to let them do it for 10 days. And in this 10 days, they prove to be the strongest, fittest, they look bright, they look wonderful, they look far more um, capable than the others, and so he lets them continue. And by the end of their time on this special diet, as they enter the king's service, they are truly called out as the brightest and the best in the court, also proving themselves to be faithful to their God. There's a lot going on in this simple little story, because food was a big deal. Both uh, literally and symbolically, food was a big deal in Daniel's time. Daniel and his friends did not want to eat the food from the king's table for fear that some of it might have been animal sacrifice that would, had been sacrificed to Babylonian idols, so the meat would indeed pollute their systems. Not only was that important because of their purity laws, but this actually, if we were using language of our time, was an act of nonviolent resistance against the king. People claiming just a little bit of power about what might seem a small thing can be a powerful place of resistance. Food was indeed a big deal in Daniel's time. For Daniel's people, the king's food would be what perhaps they might have at a wedding or another feast occasion of some kind. Food was associated with joy. Good food meant a wonderful reason to be celebrating. But the people are in exile. The people are actually in mourning. Just read the book of Lamentations. There is no joy. They want no feast foods. So to take the king's food was to acknowledge his wealth and his power and to be indebted to him for some privileges. They did not want to show this dependence on the wealth of their conquerors, nonviolent resistance to the king. Food was a big deal. If Daniel's people weren't eating like this, then Daniel and his friends were choosing not to as well. There was no reason to feast while they were being held in a foreign land. 
Now it's 2011, and food is still a big deal. One reason that we support fair trade products in this congregation is so that we might not find ourselves polluted, polluted by the idolatry that is found in the, um, the greed that causes so much economic injustice globally. We are claiming a little bit of power around what may seem like a small thing, but it is in fact a statement about justice and fairness. Food in 2011 is a big deal. Now, while it's not the goal of my reflection this morning to leave us all feeling guilty about food, we are all aware that some inside and many beyond our congregation are food insecure all the time. And I know this keenly, as do the others who participated in the food stamp challenge. After that experience, we are uh, particularly aware of this distress, the struggle it is for some people just to basically fill their tummies, the struggle of many for life itself because they do not have food to eat. While some of us eat a little too much and with incredible ease. In Idaho, in Idaho, there are 235,000 people on food stamps right now. I got this figure from uh, Idaho Health and Welfare. I talked to them in their offices this week. And Jeannie was right, half of those are children. The remainder are people who are unemployed, who are the working poor with jobs that don't pay enough, who are seniors on fixed incomes, who are folks with disabilities. And all of them are feeling this food insecurity. This is a cause for sadness. There is little to celebrate about how we distribute food on this planet. If you control the food, you control the single most essential need in any of our lives. And Daniel and his friends wanted to control their own food choices. And in doing that, in their choices, they did also what they could to stand up in their faith. And that, I think, is the challenge for us. There are so many choices in our lives, many things that we do control personally, even though there are some things that are beyond our control. But these choices we make can and do impact the lives of other people, some of them near and some of them far away. And we are not people in exile, we are free. We live in a nation where we can impact the policies that shape the lives of the people who struggle the most. It's complicated, it takes effort, it takes us educating ourselves, it takes us showing up in public ways. This is the hard work of loving our neighbor as Jesus taught and as Jesus lived. As we come to communion this morning to share this simple meal, this challenge is what I leave you as food for thought. Amen.